first I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Amanda La Liberty. I'm the program director and communications director at the Rancho Lakes Heritage Trust. Um, thank you all so much for joining us with, for this webinar this afternoon. Um, a, a little bit about the Rancho Lakes Heritage Trust is we were established in 1991 as a nonprofit, and in that time we have worked very hard to conserve over 14,000 acres. We have 34 areas that we steward with 35 miles of recreational trails. Our conservation areas are open every day uh, from dawn till dusk and they're open for exploration, hiking, photography, birding, family outings, and so much more. Um, and there are so many ways that people can be involved, people like yourselves that can be involved with the trust. You can enjoy our trails, participate in a program or a webinar like you are today. Um, you could become a supporting member or you could become a volunteer. Um, and we would love to talk to you about any of those things further. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Roberta Hill and she will speak today on aquatic invaders in the Rangeley Lakes region. Thank you very much, Amanda. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining the webinar today. I really appreciate you uh, taking time out of this gorgeous day in the, I don't know if you're all joining from the Rangeley area. I imagine that you are, and I'm sure it's really stunningly beautiful there as it is here. I'm on my porch. Um, we're all social distancing and working a lot from home these days, and there are challenges to what we're all going through, but there are some advantages too, and um, couldn't be a nicer place to be working today. So welcome all. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit about the organization that I work for, um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the Lake Stewards of Maine. We have been around for a long time. In fact, next year we'll be um, celebrating our 50th anniversary. Hopefully we'll all be out of lockdown by then and we can really have a great celebration. Um, what we'll be celebrating is these wonderful um, volunteers, steward, lake stewards, who have been uh, working very hard to keep an eye on the health of Maine lakes since 1971. Our mission is in some ways very similar to most conservation groups that um, are concerned with the health of our lakes, and that is to protect Maine lakes. But we do it in a rather unique way in the state, which we believe helps to complement the missions of all of our partners. And that is to help engage citizens in the work of collecting the enormously important uh, information. We would like it to be scientifically credible information, so it's most useful, um, that will help decision makers and managers and others protect the health of our, of our lakes. Uh, Lake Stewards of Maine is the oldest and one of the largest statewide citizen lake monitoring programs in the United States. So that's something that all Mainers and those who love Maine should be really proud of. Uh, the organization, the staff of the organization, we work behind the scenes to provide training and technical assistance for thousands of volunteer citizen lake scientists statewide. About 1,200 of those Folks have, uh, are currently active and have taken kind of the added step of becoming what we call certified. It's a higher level of training. It's a higher level of engagement. Um, there's recertification requirements. So um, it, it, they just made an extra commitment to doing this work. And we have 1,200 of those folks doing uh, this work on about 500 main lakes. By far, the Lake Stewards is the primary, geographically, the uh, primary collector of statewide lake information. We work in concert with um, state agencies and others, but in this case, with regard to invasive aquatic species, we work really hand in glove with the Maine Department of Environmental Protection <clears throat> and the DEP. Um, early on in uh, our awareness of this issue, developed what they called their action plan. It's a federally approved plan for um, making sure that Maine is prepared to um, prevent, uh, detect early, and then respond rapidly to any new infestation. And uh, we help them in every aspect of that um, management plan work but that action plan work, but we also are one of our primary programs, which we call the Invasive Plant Patrol Program, 
is really aimed at the early detection piece, getting eyes on the water to, um, to be able to spot these invasive species early before they get a real chance to get well established, when, at which time they can do a lot of damage to the ecosystem and be very, very hard, if, if they can at all, uh, be eradicated. <clears throat> Often once they're well established, it's just ongoing management from here on out. So we want to do the early detection. It's really important. So uh, we're going to just start with some of the basics. What are invasive aquatic plants? One way to say what they are is to say what they're not. They're not native plants, and there's really a distinction. So Maine's native plants are um, it, tremendously important to the overall aquatic ecosystem, especially our lake aquatic ecosystems. They provide essential habitat for wildlife, including you know, uh, some, many of the critters that are very valuable fisheries depend upon for their food, so they're really the base of the food web in many of the lakes. Uh, uh, enhance biological diversity and beauty. They occupy areas in the lake that would otherwise be available to invaders. One thing that um, we haven't, don't really have the data to prove it, but seems quite clear, is that states in this country that did not protect their native aquatic plant communities uh, through law. And, were, and people, once they moved onto a lake and they didn't like swimming through those nasty plants, uh, they were just able to remove them. Um, that kind of activity seems to correlate to states where they have many more of their lakes are infested by aquatic invaders than ours here in Maine. Only 1% of our lakes here in Maine, less than 1%, I should say, have been, um, have been uh, found to have an aquatic invader, an invasive aquatic plant. And so um, there may be a correlation between removing those native plants that provide some resilience against the invasives. And that's just another great reason uh, to protect them. So they are, these native plants are strictly protected by Maine laws. Uh, invaders, on the other hand, are not native. They came from away. Um, they're very well adapted plants, like many of our native plants are, are well adapted. They can be strong competitors, that some of our natives are pretty co strong competitors, but the issue of them being from away is kind of the clincher that makes them quite different and behave differently. Um, when they were in their natural ecosystem, whether it was South America or parts of Africa or parts of Europe, um, in that native ecosystem, there were other things in the ecosystem to help them stay in balance. They evolved with those um, organisms. So other plants that could compete equally with them, uh, herbivores that may have kept them at bay somewhat, diseases that might have afflicted them. All of those things were in that natural ecosystem. When they come inadvertently to a new ecosystem here in, in Maine, uh, none of those uh, natural checks and balances came with them. And so they can just grow rampantly out of control and soon outcompete all of our native um, plants. And then start that whole process starts rippling through the food web and can affect the entire ecosystem. Invasiveness works both ways. So some of the plants that are quite native to Maine and very harmless here uh, over in Great Britain are tr terrible invaders and they're very concerned about them. And so um, it's just a matter of which way uh, they're going. They, if they're not in their native ecosystem, they can do a lot of damage. Um, we have an officially sanctioned by Maine law list of 11 aquatic plants. These are true aquatic plants. Not, there are some, obviously some wetland plants like purple loosestrife and others that are invasive. Um, but they, these are all, the ones that are listed by Maine law in this particular law are all true aquatic plants. They thrive out in um, the open water, near shore generally, but in water, in flooded conditions. And they, um, there are 11 of them that have been deemed to be imminent threats to Maine uh, lakes and um, inland waters, and six of them are now here. So uh, the first is Eurasian milfoil, hydrilla, European naiad, 
curly leaf pondweed, variable pondweed, and European frogbit. All of those are here. And the others that you see, we don't uh, have any record of them being here yet. And we hope that they won't come. Um, there is a, a, a map that is produced by the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. It's usually widely distributed, but I think this year the best way to get it might just be to go on their website and look at it online or request one from the DEP. But it's a very useful map because it tells you where all the infestations are in the state that we know of to date. And actually this would have been at the end of two, the map was produced at the end of 2020. I don't know if they're updating it with the I mean, the end of 2019. I don't know if they're updating it with the 2020 um, fines yet, but um, you'll ha you'd have to check that. But I've kind of updated things here to a certain extent. So one thing I just want to point out that if you look at this map, um, the, the key tells you that this yellow square is variable leaf water milfoil. And you can see how that is really by far the most abundant and widespread of all of these 11 invasive aquatic plants. And most, another thing to notice is kind of what part of the state most of these infestations are located in, and it's absolutely the southern part of the state. Um, last year, um, for the first time ever in uh, the, the uh, in Washington County, this is our first infestation in Washington County, um, Big Lake, which is really right smack dab in the middle of one of the Maine's most important and uh, um, most well-known uh, fisheries and remote fisheries. And it's in the, in the lake of, called Big Lake. And uh, variable milfoil was found there last year. Um, this year, uh, variable milfoil was also found in Cobbesey Lake. So I don't think that that particular infestation made it onto this printed version of the map, but I think that the DEP might be uh, updating the online version. <clears throat> um, the thing to note about the Cobbesey infestation is if you look down here at Cobbesey Lake um, in 2019, Eurasian milfoil was found and European frogbit was found. And now with the variable leaf milfoil, that's the third invasive aquatic plant found in that one lake. And it is the first lake in Maine that has three distinctly different invasive aquatic plant species present in it. <clears throat> um, one other little update that didn't even make it onto my slide because we just learned the news yesterday is that some of the downstream lakes um, up in the Big Lake area were also um, there is now confirmed variable milfoil. So that plant is really on the move there, which again is just such a uh, bad blow to that area. Uh, so this is variable milfoil. I want you to take a look at it there in the Rangeley area. There isn't any, and so uh, you want to be really on the lookout for this. Um, it, this is a classic look for the variable milfoil, though it is called variable milfoil, so there is variation. But um, this kind of tall, uh, people call them fronds, but they're just the stem of the plant surrounded by these finely divided leaves and they're very tightly packed along the stem so it gives the plant what's known as its kind of foxtail look and uh, by far this is the most abundant aquatic invader in, or invasive aquatic plant in Maine. Hydrilla is notable, we, there aren't nearly as many infested waters with hydrilla and actually one that was very heavily infested has now been cleared. Uh, it is no longer infested. It the hydrilla was eradicated there, which is great, but it was pretty strong medicine that that little pond had to undergo in order to get that clean bill of health. A corollary would be uh, chemotherapy for cancer. It, it was basically, um, uh, there was uh, herbicide treatment for nine years, and each year that treatment had to be treated and then boosted and then boosted again. So a lot of herbicides were used in the pond, but uh, it was considered to be such a um, dangerous invader. Hydrilla is considered worldwide one of the worst of the worst aquatic invaders for all kinds of reasons. It's just a monster of a competitor. 
And um, so herbicides in general are not used in Maine in uh, aquatic herbicides because there are risks to doing so. But in this case, the, the risk of letting this cat out of the bag was so great that the determination was made by the authorities to go ahead and, and do that. But, it, but that's the good news on hydrilla for that first pond, which was called Pickerel Pond. It's off the list now, and there still are um, a couple of other infestations in Maine. Eurasian water milfoil, another terrible uh, invader, is present in a few water bodies. Curly leaf pondweed, again, um, mostly it, it is in, in, in York County known to be, and there's actually one other infestation that I didn't add here. It's now been found in the Kennebec River as well. Um, spiny naiad, um, also called brittle water nymph or European naiad, is in several water bodies, mostly in um, York County as well. And then again, Coppice Lake um, found that it had European frog bit last year. So this is the first time that that invader had been found in Maine, and um, they're working very hard to manage it. Other invaders on Maine's radar. So in addition to these invasive aquatic plants, um, we're keeping our eye out for other aquatic invaders because it's not just about plants. Um, there are invasive fauna. There's some that are already here, and here a couple of them here. Um, many of you are aware of northern pike. It's a very formidable top predator, a fish that has now been introduced into our native fisheries, and it causes all kinds of uh, trouble down the line through the fishery. They can do a lot of damage to a trout salmon fishery, which are the most valuable um, for many, many anglers. And so uh, they're just not um, good in our lakes for a lot of reasons, including that. And they, they were released. Unlike invasive aquatic plants that are primarily moved about inadvertently, they kind of hitchhike on some boating gear, or they hitchhike on a motor, they're just kind of released into the water and get a start. Uh, many times the, the invasive fish are purposefully introduced by um, folks that just think, hey, I fished for some pike out west and it was a really fun fish to try to catch because they're really, you know, really strong and really, they fight a lot. And so they were just introduced into our waters to spice up our fishery, which, um, it, you know, uh, is a real problem when people are not aware that they can cause such ecological damage. So getting the word out about that is really important. And of course, fish can swim. Plants can move about on currents, but fish can swim up or downstream. So that makes them, again, harder to manage. Rusty crayfish is one of a couple of several um, crayfish species that have been introduced in Maine. And we have uh, quite a few species of native crayfish. They're pretty unique uh, character, uh, characters in our lake. They, um, they're omnivores and they eat up and down the food chain, but they do a lot of scavenging and helping to clean up um, the debris in our lakes and so on. But the rusty is an invasive, a very, very a competitive crayfish um, that is impacting our native crayfish um, communities. Invas uh, more invasive fauna that we know occur here in Maine, Chinese mystery snail. Chinese mystery snails were initially brought to this country as a food source in the Asian market. So um, similar to the snails that uh, are eaten in Europe as escargot, the French uh, love the escargot. Um, these are edi were edible snails until they got released into the wild, at which point the snails actually do, like all of our aquatic snails, Kind of become part of a pathogen cycle and so they are now not fit to eat. But um, the uh, thing about them it, that you could easily recognize is their size. So if you see a snail of this shape that is larger than a walnut or as large as a walnut, you have Chinese mystery snail. And we are keeping a database. Um, we started doing that several years ago. I think we're up to about 80 lakes where we know they are present in Maine. 
they are born live, but they're born super tiny, so they could easily ride along in a in a bait bucket or a uh, anchor bucket or something that had just a little bit of moisture in them and then get released into another water body. And they do spread rampantly often when they get into water bodies and then they, um, you know, when they die, they wash up on shore, they're big, so they rot and they don't smell good and so on. So people are, are kind of displeased about that um, introduction. Invasive fauna continuing of the ones that are not known to occur in Maine that we're concerned about. So there are these tiny mussels, these are really pretty small, probably the size of your fingernail, um, that, uh, but they can form such an impenetrable crust over all surfaces that they are just really problematic, uh, again, for the ecosystem, but also they can fill uh, water pipes and drain pipes and so on, and uh, just uh, to the point where they have to be bored out on a regular basis. And they uh, are, have not been found in Maine. Asian clams, same, uh, again, tiny, but uh, they just are so prolific once they start growing that they just form this impenetrable um, layer. <coughs> Excuse me. Chinese mitten crab is a, a crab that lives in both um, marine ecosystems and freshwater. They, excuse me. <coughs> and uh, again, not known to be in Maine. And this shows you how small they can be. This is a tiny crustacean called spiny water flea. And here it is attached in numbers to this fishing line. And you can see this tiny barb, and it's not a tiny barb, it's compared to the rest of the creature, it's quite long, that uh, sticks out. And the problem with that is that the body of the organism is the right size for many of our fish during at least part of their uh, life cycle to consume. And so they go after them, but then that, lar that long barb makes them either uh, indigestible or maybe they won't swallow it to begin with, but it does start like punching a hole in the food web uh, because there's this whole size class of fish that are, may very well uh, starve or get these things bound up in their gut. Um, so again, in addition to invasive fauna, there's other plants that we're concerned about, not only terrestrial invaders, of course, many of you are aware of those, but the wetland uh, plants, so purple loosestrife being one of them and common reed are both invaders into our state. They're very abundant. Along our uh, along the turnpike, along our major highways, um, you can see that beautiful purple flower, and it is lovely. And some people say, "Well, what are we? Why are we complaining about that plant?" But it does the same kind of uh, thing to wetland ecosystems that the aquatic invaders do to our lakes and ponds, and that is to outcompete er everything else eventually and uh, create a monoculture where there was once tremendous diversity. So. Um, not welcome, but probably will never be fully eradicated from the state, though um, watershed to watershed and uh, people are managing it and even getting rid of it. So it really depends on what you've got for um, community resources and resilience to be able to battle some of these things. Um, Glossostigma is another aquatic plant. It's just an example of an invasive aquatic plant that has not been listed here yet in Maine. It does occur in Connecticut within a couple of years. Who knows, it could be listed in Maine because it forms this, um, again, kind of monoculture mat where there was once diversity. There's also invasive algae. Um, this one here, let me start with this one, is a macro algae. It looks like a higher plant. Those look like leaves, but it's actually a colonial algae. and. Um, it has these star-shaped bulb bills, they're called. That's the reproductive structure. And um, this is, again, another invader, not known to be here in Maine, but it's north of us and to the west of us. And so we're expecting that it might make its way here at some point. Again, to the north and to the west of us and to the south of us is this organism. It's a single cell organism, so imagine how easy it is for something like that to get from water body to water body. It'd be invisible, you'd never see it. It could be stuck to your shoe or your bathing suit or anything else and, um, and be moved from water body to water body. And it, as it 
in, during its life cycle, it attaches to the substrate using this fine fiber. And then that's what the guy's holding up is, another name for it is rock snot, which is a terrible name for it. Not only it just doesn't sound good at all, but it doesn't, it's not what it feels like. It feels like felt, it, it, it's very fibery. It's like a, a wet felt is what it feels like. But look at that river. It's a very extensive river in New Zealand where that picture was taken. And from shore to shore, the Didymo has taken over. It likes cold, clean, clear water. So many of our really pristine trout streams and so on are very susceptible to that plant. Not that algae, but it is a plant. So the impacts, you can almost start to imagine what they are. Um, because these plants can grow and spread rapidly, there's really nothing holding them back. Uh, they can just proliferate very quickly. So this is an example. So this is the spread of zebra mussels in the United States from when they were first introduced. And they were induced, introduced in ballast water from ships coming uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. And they would release their ballast water from Europe when they you know, got into the lake. And, um, and that in that ballast water were the zebra mussel larvae. And from there, they moved through water systems. So they're out through the whole Mississippi River Valley and also along highways, so on boats and so on, and really spread rapidly. So 1993, 2005, and this map is from 2019. All the red are the zebra mussels. They added in quagga mussel occurrences. And um, then when they both occur together. So you can see they've all made it out as far as California. This is great, uh, a map of Great Pond in the Belgrades. This was before there were, was a known infestation there of variable milfoil. The variable milfoil did uh, infest this stream and is now kind of pioneering its way out into this cove and they're uh, working very hard to keep that infestation in check. But before they even knew about that, they wanted to be prepared and understand how much of Great Pond could be susceptible to these invasive aquatic plants. Most of the invasive aquatic plants will be found in 15 feet of water or less. So they took a depth map and they colored in all the parts of the lake that were 15 feet or less. And you can see that roughly a third of the entire lake is susceptible to being infested. And so the fact that they're really keeping it in check there in um, Great Meadow Stream, and they've now found it in a couple other little locations, is a testimony to the importance of early detection because if they weren't really on it, um, before you know it, it could be really covering a third of the lake. Um, and again, talk about valuable lake uh, systems. The Belgrades is just, you know, kind of one of our most valuable lake systems. Um, destructive impacts on aquatic ecosystems. So this is a hydrilla infestation. This picture was taken in Florida and actually uh, when the plants first become established and they start growing, there can actually be a little bump for fish because they're getting more habitat, you know, more productive habitat, places to hide and to hunt and so on. But the growth is exponential. It's a big J curve. And pretty soon that doubling and doubling and doubling again um, fills the entire water column. Hard to hunt, hard to breathe hard to move and uh, pretty soon you've killed the fishery. They contribute to water quality de uh, decline. So many of you are aware that our lakes are already um, under some stress from human development, which is causing more nutrients to get into our lakes um, than would have naturally. And that's causing them to be more productive before their time. And so some of our lakes here in Maine are turning green in the summer uh, as a result of that. Well, this actually exacerbates that because the plants are taking nutrients that were bound up in the sediments. I don't know if that wind chime. Sorry about that. <laughs> I 
I don't know if that wind chime was pleasant or annoying, so I've taken it down just in case it was annoying you. I'm um, sorry. But um, so the, the plants, they take the nutrients that are in the sediments that were bound up there. They were not available to the algae. They live, they die, they decompose. The nutrients go back into the water column and now feeding the algae. So they're exacerbating that process of what is called cultural eutrophication. Uh, I, I, for obvious reasons, this can severely impact biodiversity. The only creatures that are doing well, uh, in addition to the hydrilla here, are the mosquitoes. The mosquitoes quite like this. And um, because of all of these reasons, uh, invasive aquatic plants are becoming one of the primary causes of freshwater species extinctions. It's really important to note that some of the aquatic and or organisms are not visible to the naked eye and they can survive out of water for several days. Those are zebra mus mussel villagers. They are 100 microns in diameter and are translucent and could fit on the tip of a strand of hair. So that's super tiny, you're not gonna see it and it could just be hitchhiking along on your gear. So we'll talk about things to do about that. But first, let's talk about economic impacts. Studies have repeatedly shown that invasive uh, plant infestations negatively impact economic activity associated with lakes and ponds. They depress tourism, recreational activity. Nobody wants to boat or swim through that. Nobody wants to rent a place on a lake that uh, this is what their swimming area looks like. Um, people don't want to buy property on that lake, and so property values go down. And we know that these um, studies have shown that aquatic invaders will really harm um, economic activity related to lakes. As to how much economic activity our lakes generate here in Maine, a study was done first in 1997. It was updated in 2005. It is due for an update again. But in 2005, even then, uh, our lakes were uh, estimated to um, to um, generate $3.5 billion in total economic activity in Maine annually. So that's a lot of money and probably one of our biggest economic engines. 8.1 million in annual income for Maine residents and 50,000 jobs depending on Maine lakes. So they really again are an enormous part of our uh, economic engine, but the depressed property values can impact the tax base. And not only as you're if you're a shorefront property owner, going to be worth less than it was before the infestation. But when you your property gets devalued, you're going to be paying less taxes. The shorefront property owners are often the hit the hardest for the tax um, funds in the community. But when that um, property values drop, the tax valuation drops, then everybody in the watershed and in the entire town is going to be paying for that. There's also control costs. Control is not easy. It takes a long time if it can ever be stopped, um, if you ever get to the end point, and where are those costs going to come from? So you can start to see how these infestations can result in some really complex social issues. Number one of which is where is the money going to come from to um, set up our program for a prevention program for preventing this from getting out to other lakes in our in our community. Where are the funds going to come from to control the infestation? Um, you know, for all of those, uh, where is the money going to come from that we're losing from the tax base? So um, that those are very challenging for communities. Fifty percent of the people in Maine get our drinking water from surface water sources, uh, lakes, ponds, rivers. And um, these invaders, once they're in a drinking water source, can cause terrible uh, problems. The water quality problem that I told you about earlier, um, those dissolved organic, uh, um, that are dissolved organic matter is like the bane of a water utility's existence. If you add chlorine to that, it actually makes a um, carcinogenic byproduct. So they don't want invaders in these surface water. Um, and can you use herbicides in a drinking water source? Well, it's been done elsewhere, but I don't think the people of Maine would be very pleased to know that herbicides were be being used in their drinking water and so on. So again, just a real big can of worms. Other questions like, 
Well, should infested water bodies be quarantined? And from a, a biological point of view, absolutely. Why not? When people get are sick with an infectious disease, we isolate them. We all know how this works now, right? You isolate them and you uh, get them healthy. You take care of them, you get them healthy, and then you allow them back out into the general population. Well, the same would be true of quarantining a lake. Make sure that nobody's uh, boating on it. No, nobody's moving things from one water body to another. But our lakes in Maine all belong to the public. And many of us have uh, relationships with Maine that go back generations, uh, with our lakes that go back generations. And when you start saying, we're going to just shut this lake off that's in your community for all use, it is not going to be an easy, um, an easy issue. Same about not restricting access because there's a lake nearby that's infested. That also is not a very good plan. One reason is because um, the people who um, would like to use that lake are might be thinking that this is just a way that the local people who live or have for shorefront property are trying to keep the lake off for themselves and they won't be there to help you when you need help with volunteers um, to, to deal with any infestation. So that we're all in this together. We've got to be thinking about it that way. Um, how do aquatic invaders spread? I've already alluded to a few ways. All it takes is a tiny fragment of the stem in some cases or a seed. Uh, these are um, some little reproductive structures, a turion, some tubers. All it takes is a little fragment to start a new infestation. Now these fragments of plants can move around uh, naturally by wildlife. Uh, wildlife are out there in the plants all the time and they can move them from water body to water body. Some of these invasive aquatic plant parts can move right through the digestive system of waterfowl and um, without being harmed whatsoever and to be deposited in the next lake that that uh, duck happens to visit. So those are called wildlife vectors and there's not much that we're going to do to deal with that. But by far, and the studies again have shown this by just the where, where the spread happens and how it's usually associated with the boat landings and the hot major highways and so on really shows that we're the primary vector moving these plants around. These were not staged photos. This is, these are invasive aquatic plants that when the, uh, the trailer was backed into the boat landing with the boat, picked up the plants, we'll get the boat, the, we'll go to the, off to the next lake, maybe within a couple of days, but many of these plants can survive um, and then make it into the next lake. All it needs is a little fragment to fall off. Some roots will start jetting out and it will settle to the bottom and a new infestation will start. Home aquaria and water gardens are another way. These plants get released into nature and um, you know, not ever a good idea to uh, think that you're be doing a kindness when you're kind of running down on your number of fish and you think, well, I'm just not going to do this anymore, but I don't want to kill the fish, so I guess I'll just release them. Never, ever a good idea. There's so many things in that tank that could be harmful to our systems, but it has been done in the past. Some of these plants are known to be so hard to kill that they made good aquarium plants, and so um, they might very well be amongst the plants that would be in an aquarium. Water garden plants, same thing. Other vectors, uh, anything that um, you, your, all of your fishing gear can pick up and snag a plant, all the, um, the buoys and the, um, the, de the decoys that duck hunters use, that whole system of um, lines and decoys can also trap stuff, float planes, um, bait, uh, people who catch bait in uh, minnow traps and so on, all of the, that gear. Basically, anything that you put into one water body and you take out and then you put at some point down the line into another water body can be a vector. So that means that we have this point of intervening between those water bodies and that's what we need to do. Um, we'll talk about that in just, just one second. So I already mentioned this, we're starting with a really great advantage here in Maine. Unlike other states that kind of only became aware of this and by the time they really became aware of this problem, 
almost half their lakes were infested already. So we are really lucky in that less than 1% of our lakes are known to be invest, infested with an invasive aquatic plant. And in 1999, we started adopting a series of laws aimed at preventing the spread of these plants in our state. And um, we now are working together, state and local um, groups are working to control invasive aquatic plants where they are known to be. And that there really are some challenges to this control work. There really are no silver bullets. The work is costly and difficult. It's often e disruptive to the ecosystem as well. You have to lay down a benthic mat, which kills everything underneath it, including the native plants and some of the native organisms that live in that benthic environment. Um, often a short-term solution to a very long-term problem. So you're going to re be repeating it over and over and over again, year after year. And frankly, none of us have been at this long enough to know what are they going to be the unknown long-term um, impacts from this control activity itself. Um, the control methods most commonly used in Maine are um, methods called um, manual methods or physical methods. In other words, um, basically you're doing stuff with your hands. So manual removal is just like weeding, careful weeding. So divers have to go down and very, very carefully remove the plant, remove all of the root, make sure you get it all, get it into a net bag, carry it to the surface and so on. Very laborious, time consuming work. Benthic barriers, if the infestation is quite widespread in an area and one monoculture, that's a good uh, time to use a benthic barrier, which is basically like using black plastic mulch in your garden. It's some kind of fabric that's laid down on the lake bottom and then weighted down because the gases, when decompose, decomposition happens, start bubbling up and start lifting the mat up, which could very much interfere with boating traffic and so on. But they're weighted down and they, uh, that mat is intended to keep all of the sunlight out and then just starve the plants of their source of energy and kill them all. So that's a benthic mat. They're also generally installed by uh, divers. And then diver assistant suction harvesting is really a technology that Maine has, uh, many groups here in Maine have done a lot tinkering with the, uh, with the technology to come up with some very, very nice innovations. Basically, it's just a sophisticated way of doing manual removal using a suction dredge like hose where you carefully removing each plant but then you can feed it into a suction tube and it's collected on the surface of the pontoon boat and then uh, put in onion bags or some other device where it can then be um, you know taken to a facility where it's composted or, or buried or something like that. Chemical control is seen in the state of Maine as a method of last resort to be used in only extraordinary circumstances. So again, the hydrilla infestations were seen as those a uh, couple of those um, extraordinary cir circumstances. But unlike other states in the country where herbicides are often the first tool in the toolbox, here in Maine, absolutely the last tool in the toolbox, but cer certainly it's there. Um, we provide training for divers. Uh, this year was a little different, but they were all online and then there was one and one uh, in the field uh, training going on to make sure that the divers know how to do this work safely, how to do it effectively, so we're not causing more harm than, than good. Basically, we want to make sure that all the work is doing what it's intended to do. Uh, the good news is that what our, all of our efforts are paying off. We've already delisted a number of water bodies here in Maine, meaning that after three, and in case of hydrilla, five years, of being found to be invader free, they're taken off the infested list. And so again, this is the incredible record uh, you know, across the country. You're just not seeing this high record of the percentage of lakes that have come off of our list. So it may, tells you something about we're, we're doing a, a good job. Other lakes are, are getting close or they're only gathering maybe a, a a uh, five gallon bucket or so of weed a year. In almost every case, these good news stories are the result of early detection, catching it early before the plants became well established in the water body, which again kind of harkens to the importance of 
our efforts in our invasive plant patrol program and then dedicated volunteer efforts really helping with all of these management um, uh, ongoing management efforts so what can we all do the importance of public involvement in this effort cannot be overstated we just got too much water here in Maine um, and to, for uh, the professionals to do this work on their own. So it re really requires all of us. But the good news is that there is, are some very, very simple things that we can do. And prevention is the first step. So before you leave the launch, you, if you check everything, um, your, your anchor lines, live well, fishing gear, roller bunks, a motor and shaft, you, you can see on this illustration, all the little nooks and crannies where plants may be hiding or hitchhiking, um, and just remove anything that you find on your boat trail and equipment. Now, by main law, if you're found driving down the road with any kind of plant, whether it's grass out of the field behind your house, you can get a serious fine. So they, they don't discriminate. You can't have any plant material dangling off of your boat and you could certainly get a fine but uh, just much more from a prevention standpoint it's just always good practice to be really careful before and after you launch after you leave the launch if you can clean your boat your tackle your trailer all equipment to kill invasive species that are not visible um, that you and that you did not see at the boat launch use hot tap water and dish soap if you can nice bucket with some hot water, get some gloves on and dish soap or a high pressure sprayer. So you can actually take your gear to a, a good uh, do-it-yourself car wash place and give it a really good cleaning. Then drain all the water that might be in your uh, motor, bilge, live wells, any equipment, anchor buckets, do that well away from any water source. And then ideally drive everything dry everything for at least five days because again some of these aquatic organisms can persist especially if it's kind of a moist um, not really dry weather um, it's not always possible to give it that long of a dry uh, but do the best that you can the more that you can do the better we will prevent uh, this so this is kind of the mantra clean drain and dry and um, if we all do those things, we will go a long way to preventing the spread of these uh, invasive aquatic organisms here in Maine. This one's pretty easy, avoid boating in infested areas. If you can go on and see that map and check it out to see if the lake that you're planning to visit is infested, uh, just know about that. And once you get into the lake, generally, the local people have marked those areas with others. Uh, the state provides these very noticeable yellow buoys saying invasive species. I forget exactly what they say, but they'll have some kind of warning. And um, you're not required by Maine law to stay out of those areas, but it's a, it's a really good thing for you to do because if we can just stay out of them, uh, we can allow those who are working on that to manage them without the added um, headache of having boats come through and chop the stuff up and create more problems. Put signs at your boat landings. The state provides these little yellow signs free of charge and you just have to call the DEP and you can get one for a popular boat landing in your area if there's not already one. But some uh, communities have developed much bigger signs that are way harder to uh, miss and uh, letting people know that there are fines for not abiding by main laws and so on. Uh, inform your community about what, um, you know, about the threat and what can be done about it. So all of these groups who are really stakeholders in our lake should know about this. And um, if you're somebody who's in a position to spread the word out to others, uh, that's really valuable. And then, as mentioned by Elena earlier, you can join the statewide volunteer effort. And in Rangeley, we have a lot of people working in this area. I'll tell you, we have courtesy boat inspectors up there. Um, these are people who are really providing the first line of defense, greeting the boaters when they come to the boat landings, educating them about the threat, telling them why we care about it here in Maine, offering to show them how to conduct a thorough survey of their boat. They're doing it even in the age of COVID at some boat landings. Other communities have decided not to do it this year, which means that the, that uh, job of 
reminding boaters falls upon all of us individually to just remind ourselves but uh, courtesy boat inspectors play a really important role and that program has really saved a number of main lakes we're very certain of it we have more uh, surveys um, of these uh, courtesy boat inspections being performed every year across the state and um, last year 2901 plants were removed off of boats coming or going into main waters and 74 of them were invasive plants 74 might not sound to you to be a, a large number but that's 74 potential infestations which is incredible so uh that's really working but as i said um you know this year courtesy boat inspections are going to be down a bit i believe because you know in some communities the cbis were primarily folks that might be in that more vulnerable demographic and they just weren't comfortable um do, having some kind of public facing uh, position this year so they were they opted out so that means that we really have to take on our, our own personal responsibility and the fact of the matter is that most lakes in Maine don't have CBIs and and also that even lakes that do have CBIs they're not there 24 7. so really it's up to each one of us to develop a habit a habit just like brushing our teeth <laughs> uh, that we just do consistently before we launch and after we get out of the water checking our boats something will slip through the cracks whether from a lake where a CBI was not present and somebody didn't inspect their boat or from waterfowl or for some other reason, something is going to slip through that defensive um, layer that we have put on, on with the courtesy boat inspections. So we need a second line of defense and that's the early detection piece. Um, one thing we can all do is just be on alert for suspicious uh, organisms, but especially because um, they're easy to um see once they're there and you know just a little bit of information um these suspicious plants this is a really important point alert and informed citizens have been the early detectors for almost every documented infestation in maine not just trained invasive plant patrollers they've been uh, in charge of several of these early detections but just alert and informed citizens. It doesn't take a high level of training to be a very formidable early detector. We do uh, at the Lake Stewards of Maine uh, provide training to uh, allow you to do this work more effectively and efficiently. We welcome all of you to uh, join this work. It's actually really important, as I'm already trying to stress here, but the good news is it's also really uh, fun. It, you'll learn stuff, something every time you go out in the water. You're picking the choice days to go out to do this work, choice times of day you wanna go when the water is just flat like glass and sunlight is good and um, a very special time to be on a, a lake in Maine and uh, you've got a purpose. So it's really educate, it's really recreation with a purpose. So I put a little plug in for it. And now it couldn't be easier to become a certified, if you'd like to become certified, it's totally optional, invasive plant patroller because we've put the whole training program online. It used to be, maybe some of you on this presentation have been to one of our six hour classroom trainings. They're, they're good, you learn a lot, you get to work with live plant material which is really valuable but there's six hours which is a little of a heavy lift for a lot of people but now you can go on we've broken it all up into little chunks and you can work your way through the uh, program at your leisure all the webinars are on there at the end of every webinar you can take a very uh, clear quiz that's uh, not intended to trick you in any way just basically intended to um, reinforce the stuff that you learned in the webinar. And um, then if you choose to, you can become a certified plant patroller. So please come to our website, Lake Stewards of Maine, go to the workshop tab, go down to the invasive plant patrol workshops. It couldn't be easier to become certified. Or, and if you don't wanna be certified, just to learn this information so that you can really be a very effective um, a, a invasive plant patroller on your lake. I know that um, even though Rangeley Lakes has 
uh, invasive plant patrollers on almost all of the lakes in its region, um, they're always looking for more people to join. The more people doing this work, the easier it is for everybody because nobody has to do too much. Everybody can just do a nice little doable chunk of the what's called the littoral zone where the plants are growing. So um, please do consider that. Um, here's a great story about the effectiveness of that kind of work. Here's Dick Butterfield, a guy we trained in 2008. He came to one of our six hour trainings. He went back and he said, well, I'm just gonna go and see if I can do this work at a little cove near his place on Damariscotta Lake. He pulled into this little cove, it was very productive. He saw all of these floating leafed plants on the surface. These are all native plants. He'd been trained to not just look at the surface, to look down below as well. He collected what was growing below, he pulled it out, he looked at it, he had been trained to count. If you see a plant with blade-shaped leaves arranged in a whorl around the stem, count the number of leaves per whorl. If you see more than three, be suspicious. If you see serrations along the edges of the leaves, be super suspicious. He saw both, he knew he had hydrilla, he sent it to us for confirmation. Within one day, the main DEP was in the water, um, starting to manage that infestation, first pulling it, putting down some benthic mats, putting in a um, barrier to prevent anything from getting out of that little cove into the higher ground. And that we would like you to join us in this endeavor. And please do consider coming back and joining us online for our um, IPP 101 workshops. And thank you again for staying on the call, everybody. And I am sorry that I went over Amanda <laughs> and David. So um, goodbye, everyone. Signing out. <laughs> I just want to let everybody know that uh, this session has been recorded. We're going to edit it, um, edit out a few of my giggles, and email it to everybody. And it will also be hosted on our YouTube channel. Um, so thank you so much, Roberta. I know I personally learned a lot. And if anybody has any more questions, um, I've provided her email in the chat. Um, and I certainly include that in the uh, webinar video as well. I got Thanks, it. Roberta. I've actually copied the chat as well. Thank you, David. Bye, thank everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Signing off.